Welcome to Calvary Chapel Bournemouth. Today our message is on the Paschal Sacrifice, Korban Pesach. So understanding then the Passover, um, how Passover was celebrated in biblical times. I want to trace a little bit of the history of the Passover. Um, it was called the Hag Pesach, which is the festival of the Paschal Lamb. So the sacrificial rite of the Paschal Lamb and its consumption was the main feature of the ancient Passover ceremony that ushered in the holiday, the festival of Passover, Hag Pesach. This unique ritual included the slaughtering of the lamb on the afternoon of the 14th of Nisan. This is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. This was an exception to the general rule that all festival offerings are to be sacrificed on the day of the festival. Furthermore, the lambs were slaughtered by the Israelites, privately by each family, and the priests poured the blood on the base of the altar. All the other offerings were generally slaughtered by the priests. When the second temple was destroyed in 70 BC, all sacrifice eventually ceased, and only the Samaritans continued to bring an offering in their own community. To this day, they slaughter a lamb at sunset, read Exodus chapter 12, and eat the Passover meal after midnight together with unleavened bread, matzah and bitter herbs. The explanation of the uniqueness of the Passover sacrificial rite may be found in its commemorative aspects. The Bible repeatedly emphasised this facet of Passover. And this day shall be for you a memorial, Exodus chapter 12, 14. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you come out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, Exodus 13. You shall remember what your God did to Pharaoh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, 18. That you may remember the day when you come out of the land of Egypt, all the days of your life. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3. These verses are a clear and constant reminder, indication, sorry, that the general function of the Passover pageantry was to serve as a constant reminder to the Israelites of their struggle against slavery and their wondrous deliverance from Egyptian bondage. So the festival of the Pas Paschal Lamb was ushered in on the evening of the 14th of Nisan. That'll be the 22nd of April in 2024. On that night, the Israelites were ordered to eat the Paschal lamb, and several restrictive rules were added to this feast. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Exodus chapter 12, verse 8. They were not to eat it rare or boiled in water. Exodus 12, 9. They were not to leave the meat over past the conclusion of the night. Exodus 12, 10. They were not to break any of the bones of the lamb. Exodus 12, 46. No alien sojourner, no hired servant or uncircumcised person may eat of the meat of the paschal lamb. Exodus 12, 43 to 45. And finally, the feast was to be held in one house and no part of the meat was to be taken outside of the house. Exodus 12, 46. So the occasion was one of reaffirming God's covenant with the Israelites. The symbolism of the eating of the Paschal lamb with the matzah, with the, the flattened unleavened bread and bitter herbs, was a reminder to the Israelites of an enslaved past. Interestingly, the smear of blood on the doorposts did not become a part of the Passover pageantry. Since all paschal lambs were slaughtered in Jerusalem once the temple was built, the Israelites would have been too far from their homes to smear blood on their doorposts. So, there's the smearing of the blood on the lintel and the doorposts, which saved them from the angel of death. We then have the celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag HaMatzot. The principal feature of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is stated in the Bible. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. 
The unleavened bread commemorated the speed with which the Jews had to leave Egypt and thus become symbolic of Israelite redemption. Now, this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. Exodus chapter 12. So, we've got then here Joshua, other celebrations in the Passover in the Bible. The observance of the first Passover in Israel is mentioned in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. Here it is said that the Israelites, led by Joshua, successor to Moses, kept the feast at Gilgal. This reference to Passover stresses the classical message of the festival, the humble origin of the Jewish people, the covenant with Abraham, God's intervention in Egypt, the fulfilment of God's promises, and the reaffirmation of faith. For about three centuries after the death of Joshua, anarchical conditions loomed as a result of lack of leadership and constant harassment by hostile neighbours. During this time, Passover played little or no role in the national life of the people. The appearance of Samuel in the 11th century BC, at the end of the period of the Judges, brought about a religious revival. Passover again assumed its prime function as a religious festival. About 400 years after Samuel, during the religious revival of King Josiah, 637 to, 600, uh, 637 to 607 BC, reference was made to a Passover celebration with this statement. The king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. For there was not kept such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. But in the eighteenth year of King Josiah was this Passover kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. 2 Kings chapter 23 verses 21 to 23. The religious revival that began with Samuel continued through the reign of King David and King Solomon with the construction of the first temple in Jerusalem around about 1000 BC. The construction in the magnificent temple in Jerusalem led to new significance to the festival of Passover. The Talmudic passage dating from the, second, from the period of the second temple about 515 BC to 70 AD, describes the temple ritual on the 14th of Nisan. The description reflects the procedure in the, first in the time of the first temple. The paschal lamb was slaughtered in three groups. An Israelite slaughtered his offering and the priests caught the blood. The priest passed the basin to his fellow priest and he to his fellow, each receiving a full basin and giving back an empty one. The priest nearest to the altar tossed the blood against the base of the altar. While the ritual was performed, the Levites sang the Hallel, the Psalms. That's found in Talmud, Pesachim 64a. 
There are several biblical references indicating that this procedure was also followed in Solomon's temple. Following the rededication of the temple by King Hezekiah, the priests are described as tossing the blood of the paschal lamb upon the altar, 2 Chronicles 30.16. The Levites and priests are also described as having praised God day by day, singing with loud instruments to God. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 21. In the year of 932 BC, Jeroboam, the first king of Israel, reintroduced idolatry. Paganism spread throughout Israel and Judea and reduced the number of Jews who made the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. In the year 720 BC, King Hezekiah set out to restore the ancient covenant. In his address to the priests and Levites, he said, Now, it is in my heart to make a covenant with the God of Israel. 2 Chronicles 29.10 The renewal of the covenant was to be formalised by a national celebration of Passover, with the Paschal Lamb ritual as the highlight to the celebration. King Josiah in 637 BC next spearheaded the Jewish spiritual revival with the accidental discovery of a scroll in the, in the course of repair work to the Jerusalem temple. A public celebration of Passover with the slaughtering of Paschal lambs was the climax of festivities. So when the second temple was completed in 515 BC, the entire biblical ritual of Passover was restored. Priests and Levites slaughtered the Paschal offerings for the returning Jews of the Babylonian captivity. The new community kept the festival of the Matzot seven days with joy, for God had made them joyful. Ezra 6.22 So Jesus, um, after the rebuilding, um, at around about 33-35, uh, was crucified and he was recognised as by the followers as the king of the Jews. And he uh, can be seen, we can see uh, symbolically, as the bread, the bread of life. Um, and regarding the matzah, we will see how the bread was broken. And so lots of symbolism regarding then the nature of the brokenness of Jesus, how the kings celebrated when they have a revival, the Paschal Lamb, um, and Jesus, of course, then with the Lord's Supper, made this a, a very key point uh, with his disciples, that Jesus was offering his body and his blood uh, in light of the Lord's Supper, the Passover. So with the destruction of the temple then in 70 AD, the offering of the Paschal Lamb came to an end. So Jesus, when he died, there was some a period of time afterwards um, of the offering, but of course the curtain had been torn in two when he died. And so that makes a, clearly a significant difference to the high priestly atonement. Um, on the eve of the ninth of Tishri, pious Hebrews now provide themselves with a kepora atonement and this goes on even to today so the means of atonement a rooster for a male and a hen for the female after he has recited the prayers the man swings the, the fowl three times around his head and devoutly recites this is my change this is my redemption this rooster is going to be killed and I will be admitted to a long, happy and peaceful life. In the law, God did not command that a rooster or a hen should be used as atonement for the soul. He prescribed two goats, one for the Lord and one for, the Az for Azazel. The blood of those goats, however, could not atone for sin, but in a symbolic way rolled the sins of the pious worshipper forward one year when another sacrifice had to be offered. The importance of obeying the Lord implicitly may be seen in the case of the death angels passing over Egypt the night Israel left. The strict obedience to the demand of the Lord, the blood of the Passover lamb, was sprinkled upon doorposts and lintels of every Hebrew home. The Egyptians had no Passover with its blood. When the death angel passed over the land, he slew the firstborn of the Egyptians. Whereas the firstborn of the Israelites, being screened behind the blood, were spared. 
No substitute on the part of Israel would have saved the firstborn, neither will it today. Israel today is without atonement, as Egypt was. When you die without atonement, you will have to face judgment. Jesus, who came as the high priest, offered himself as the Lamb at the cross, making atonement once and for all for those who recognise him and call on his name and receive him as Lord, recognise he died on the cross for their sins and rose from the dead on the third day, they will be saved. Atonement, covering for sin by the blood of the Lamb, only comes through the, the Lord Jesus. The Afikoman means dessert, a word originally uh, to have the connotation of refreshments eaten after the meal. It's now almost strictly associated with a half piece of matzah bread, which is broken in two during the early stages of the Passover Seder and set aside to be eaten as a dessert after the meal. Notice the matzah bread. It is buried halfway through the meal. It is pierced through, you will see holes through the middle of the matzah. It's broken in two, and later on it is found by children. Clearly a symbolic representation of Jesus, who was striped, he was beaten, he was pierced, he was buried, his body, um, although the bones, like the Passover lamb, were not broken, he then rose from the dead, like children, was being sent to find the Afkoman, he's found by those, and Jesus said, unless you come as a child, you shall not find the kingdom of God. So based on the Mishnah in Pesachim 119b, the Afikoman is a substitute today for Jewish people at the pass, uh, for the Passover sacrifice, which was the last thing eaten at the Passover meal during the eras of the first and second temple and during the period of the tabernacle. The Talmud states that it is forbidden to have any other food after the Afikoman, so that the taste of the matzah that was eaten after the meal remains in the participants' mouth. So that clearly points to the when Jesus returns for the marriage supper of the Lamb, there will be that wonderful party that will go on forever. Since the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the discontinuation of the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb, Jews now eat a piece of matzah, now known as the Afikoman, to finish the Passover Seder meal. Customs around the Afikoman vary, though they often share the common purpose of keeping children awake and alert during the Seder until after the Afikoman is eaten. Following Ashkenazi customs, the head of the household may hide the Afikoman for the children to find. Or alternatively, the children may steal the Afikoman and ransom it back. The Afikoman is prepared during the fourth part of the Seder, the Yachatz. During this ritual, the leader of the Seder takes the middle piece of the matzah out of the stack of three whole matzah in the Seder table. Three. Very interesting symbolism. Lots of different meanings of it, but clearly from a biblical messianic perspective, you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the middle one being taken out, being the Son, broken for the sins of the world, according to Isaiah 53. They break this matzah in two, returning the smaller piece to the snack and putting aside the larger piece to be eaten later during the zafun, hidden the twelfth part of the Seder, which immediately follows the main meal. This is the Afikoman, which is wrapped in a napkin before being eaten. Clearly we have the Lord being wrapped in linen clothes. So eating the Afikoman after the meal and customary desserts, the leader of the Seder distributes pieces of the Afikoman to each guest. The Jewish law prescribes that an olive-sized piece of matzah be eaten to fulfil the mitzvah, of eating the Afikoman, the law. Many people eat an additional olive-sized piece of matzah together with it. 
The first piece of matzah commemorates the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb, whose meat was eaten at the very end of the festive Seder meal in the days of the temple, that the temple stood. Notice, by the way, of course, it was Abel that offered a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord, but it was Cain that offered the grain sacrifice. The matzah will not suffice as a, an atonement. Only the blood that was, accept, was acceptable. The second piece commemorates the matzah that was eaten together with the meat of the Paschal Lamb in the days of the Temple, in fulfilment of the Torah commandment. They shall eat the Passover lamb together with matzah and maror, the bitter herbs. Like the eating of the matzah early in the Seder, the apicoman is eaten while reclining to the left. According to the Jewish law, the Afikoman must be consumed before midnight, just as the Korban Pesach was eaten before midnight, during the days of the Temple in Jerusalem. Thus, if the Seder is running late, with much singing and discussion of the themes of the Exodus from Egypt, families may have to shorten the meal segment of the Seder and proceed quickly to the Afikoman. After eating of the apicoma, no other food may be eaten for the rest of the night, other than the last two cups of wine at the Seder and coffee, tea or water. Jesus clearly, from a Messianic Jewish perspective, is the fulfilment of the Paschal Lamb. And also, significantly, one can see him fulfilling the later Talmudic idea of the apicoma. The lamb is chosen on the 10th day of Nisan, then inspected. Jesus entered Jerusalem, and then he was also, at the very time when the lambs were being entered for the Passover, he was also under inspection. The four days until his crucifixion was parallel to the Passover lambs. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 70 to 20, Apostle Peter writes, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of the Messiah. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last days for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Redemption is no afterthought. The Lord's timing was perfect. Four days also can be symbolic, literally. Indeed, consider chapter uh, 2 of Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 to 9. So 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 to 9. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. We have this idea of 4,000 years leading up to the time when the Messiah is cut off. The four days, four millennial. The Messiah was slain, slain at the end of the four millennial days of human history. The New Testament writers describe the way in which Yeshua can be viewed as God's servant, emphasizing his humility and unselfishness, which clearly is in opposite to the idea of leaven. Leaven is equal to pride. We are to rid ourselves of pride. Satan's fall was led by his pride. Pride was found in him. We must be diligent to rid ourselves of all pride arrogance 
and selfishness and seek like the Lord in Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8, humbled himself unto death on a cross. For the, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are likewise as disciples to follow Jesus and humble ourselves and serve, even if it means death. The prologue to deliverance is captivity. Before the Passover is the Bedaika, Bedaika Chametz, the searching for leaven. Before the Passover, the custom is to rid the house of leaven, as admonished by Rabbi Saul. Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. David Barron, photograph here of a Messianic Jewish man, shared his testimony of his father, recognising the futility of the Talmudic practices. I well remember the interest which, as a boy, I used to follow about my father on the evening before the 14th of Nisan, as with a lighted candle wax in my hand after uttering the prayer. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and commanded us to remove the leaven. He proceeded to search all likely and unlikely places all over the house for leaven, picking up a few crumbs of bread which had been purposely dropped there before and gathering the whole into a large wooden spoon and tying it together ready for the ceremonial burning before noon the next day, ending the whole by utterly uttering the formula in the Chaldaic language, all the leaven in my possession, that which I have seen and that which I have not seen, be it null, be it accounted as the dust of the earth. Prophetically, Israel as a nation is presently being humbled. The 7th of October is clearly also an opportunity to recognise that Israel must seek, they must diligently, rip, diligently rid themselves of the leaven. They must return to the Lord. They must call on the name of the Messiah, Yeshua Hamashiach. Before their full redemption, they are to rid themselves of leaven. The Afikoman is hidden, except for the child that seeks diligently for him. You can only come to the Messiah unless, unless you humble yourself diligently. You must seek and he will be found. Jesus is hidden from the unbelieving and the arrogant and the proud. There is no atonement, as it were, for the Pharaoh. But there is for the true Israelite that seeks for the Passover lamb, that seeks in their hearts to personally recognise them. Jesus said that unless you become as a child, you will not see the kingdom of God, but you will face the burning, as it were, of David Barron's father's leaven every year. There is no salvation apart from that which is found in Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Do not wait for the day of burning to do have remorse, but today... Turn to the Messiah, in whom there is deliverance from the angel of death and Satan. And there is deliverance and salvation to the promises that are given to Abraham. They are yea and amen in the Messiah, Yeshua. There is life, eternal, full salvation in and through the bread that was broken for us. Through his blood, there is life, the lamb that takes away the sins, not only of Israel, but of the world. Believe today in the name of the Lord Jesus, that he died on your behalf, rose on the third day. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. 
And after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant. Come to the Lord. The Lamb has been slain. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. We thank you for the Messiah who hung on the cross, the King of the Jews, who became the Lamb. We thank you, Father, for your precious Son who shared his blood, shed his blood that we might have atonement. We thank you that we may feast on the Paschal Lamb by faith and being found in you, have faith for eternal life and joy everlasting. Thank you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Messiah. Amen.